Uh, this morning, as we continue in our series, looking at the book of uh, Micah, or specifically through the Minor Prophets, we're looking at Micah this morning. You know, we know that the Bible has one author, right? God is really the author. There are 40 writers. God inspired it and wrote through 40 different people um, to uh, write his word. And there's really one subject. It's really from beginning to end. It's all about Jesus and salvation and how we can know God personally. And so it's easy when you're looking in the New Testament to see all about Jesus, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and we read about him walking on water and healing the, the feeding the 5,000 and raising the dead, and we see all of that. It can be a little harder to read the Old Testament and see Jesus there. He's there, but it takes a little bit more work. Well, this morning in Micah, we've got a passage that is, that is just so abundantly clear. We're really going to talk about Jesus and how he changes our life and how that is it's so clear, specifically in the book of Micah. Do you remember the story when Jesus was born? Do you remember the, the, the three magi, wise men, kings? Uh, we really don't know if there were three. It was just plural, so there were at least two. Could have been 20. Could have been two, could have been 200. We really don't know. The, historically or traditionally, we say three because, right, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, like three, they each brought one gift, and we don't really know how many there were. But uh, they came to Jerusalem uh, following the star, a supernatural sign, if you will, that, uh, that God had put in the sky for them to discover uh, Jesus. And they came to Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews. And you remember the story, King Herod was deeply troubled by it. He had just a little bit of an insecurity issue, just a small one, if you will. And, uh, and so he calls, he hears about this new king in town, and he's like, what in the world is this? And so he calls the Jewish scribes and the, 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 the scholars and, and says to them, uh, hey, by the way, where is this new king supposed to be born? And they quote, Micah chapter 5, in Bethlehem, the Bible says that will, God will raise up his ruler who will shepherd Israel. And then because Herod was such a megalomaniac and so insecure, he proceeded to have all the children two years and under in Bethlehem slaughtered and murdered. And if you know the story, God reveals to Joseph and Mary uh, through an angel to leave, get out of Dodge, and they go down to Egypt and, uh, and they hide safe there until Herod is dead and they come on back. So anyway, let's look at Micah chapter 5. I want to show you Jesus in the book of Micah and how he comes to truly change our lives. If you know anything about our church, we love talking about life change. We love what God does in a person's heart when he does in a marriage, what he does in a family, when people finally realize that, that there is a God in heaven that they can know and trust and surrender their life to, and then he can clean up the junk on the inside, clean up the stuff together, and it's amazing the changes that he brings, and so we're going to focus on that in Micah 5. So read with me if you would. Micah chapter 5, verse 1 and following. The Bible says this, God is speaking, and he says, Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, insignificant little town, know nothing on the, on the world as it were, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Skip down to verse 4. And he, talking about that ruler, that shepherd, we know now is Jesus, he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, in the name of the I am that I am his God. And they, talking about the people, shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great, to the ends of the earth, in the beginning of verse 5, and he shall be their peace. I want to talk to you this morning about Jesus' supernatural identity. And out of that supernatural identity, his supernatural power, that those two things together produce supernatural results in our life, and it happens through a supernatural salvation. It happens through God doing something amazing to save us out of our sin. Jesus' supernatural identity, 
that brings his supernatural power that unleashed in our life produces supernatural results that we experience through the supernatural salvation of a holy God in heaven. Before I talk about that, pray with me, would you? Lord, we thank you for a new morning, a new day to draw breath, a new day to experience life and relationships, and especially a relationship with you. Father, I pray that you would take these words, these truths that were uttered thousands of years ago, and that you would bring them, press them in on our heart and our soul this morning, Father, we don't need my words today. We really need your words. Lord, would you take these truths, would you speak them into our heart? Father, we, to the best that we know how, we open our ears, our minds, our heart to you for these next few minutes. Would you work in us and among us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, you Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth from me, this is God speaking, one who is to be ruler in Israel. Isn't it like God who always seems to choose the inconspicuous to do the, the, the non-important, the non-flashy, the non-showy when he sends Jesus, he's born in a manger, born in a stable, born in a, 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 a nowhere kind of land on this planet. Uh, Israel was really nothing significant in terms of a place, and Bethlehem especially was an insignificant kind of location, but it was in that place that God would raise up his ruler. The book of Micah, from beginning to end, it has kind of, uh, as a prophet, it, it's telling, Micah is telling the people about the things that they've done wrong, about how messed up they are, and he tells them kind of in three different sections of the book, but he always comes back, and God always makes sure that the people know there's hope, there's salvation offered, there's forgiveness. God's not just a God of, of justice, he's also a God of, of mercy. He's a God that says, hey, I've got a holy standard, break my standard and you've got problems, but if you call out to me and turn to me, I will forgive you. I will bring my mercy and my salvation and my grace into your life. So, so God holds that standard, but he also offers a, a forgiveness and a new life. And this morning, as we look at chapter 5, he's telling us about that new life that he's bringing. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, and 4 talk more about the judgment of God. And uh, you can go read that yourself. But I want us to talk about what God is doing, especially in chapter 5, and bringing his ruler, his savior, his Messiah. Verse 1, the Bible starts out in chapter 5, a little bit cryptic. If you're like me, I read that and I said... Well, what does that mean? You know, I do that a lot. I don't know if you ever do that in the Bible, but I'm like, I read that. I don't know what that means. And thankfully, there's people smarter than me, and I do a little bit more reading of them and a little more reading of Scripture. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So here's the deal. We know all along that God said, hey, Israel, if you obey me, I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. But if you disobey me, you stop following me. You start following other idols. You start living your life for yourselves I'm going to allow a conquering king to come in and he's going to conquer you and they're going to deport you and they're going to lead you away. Remember when we looked at the book of Daniel? Nebuchadnezzar was that king that came in and had, had conquered Israel. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is the one that fulfills this prophecy. This is written before Nebuchadnezzar ever came into town. And it's a prophecy talking about the, the king of, of Israel. And, and later on in Scripture, we discover that when Nebuchadnezzar came in, he captured King Zedekiah. And King Zedekiah, he, he, he captured and, and right in front of his eyes, killed his sons, all of his sons, killed his progeny. You know, if you want to be king and make sure that you put down all your enemies, that's a good thing to do. You just kill everybody off and you don't have any more enemies. Nobody can do anything. But then what he did, the king Zedekiah, was he didn't kill him to add shame and disgrace upon shame and disgrace. He put his eyes out. So the last things that this king saw were his own sons being executed. That's what the Bible's talking about in verse 1, that there are troops. There are so many troops that Jerusalem would be a city of troops, and siege is laid against them, and that there would be a rod that would strike the judge of Israel on the Cheek. Well, that's a metaphor for what happened later in, in history under King Zedekiah. I want you to notice first thing this morning that 
Jesus, our Lord, is not like any human ruler. Zedekiah was a weak ruler, just as a human. I mean, if you're king, you've done something right, at least born into the right family. So I'm not going to say that he was uh, completely incompetent or whatever. But regardless, God's ruler is a very different kind of ruler. You see in verse 2, he is very different. God's ruler would be completely different. That he would come, he would be the one that would be ruler in Israel. And later we discovered that he would stand in verse 4 that he would stand up and that over all the earth he would be able to stand, that no one would be able to depose him, no one would be able to conquer him, to strike him down, and because he is the, the, the chosen one of God. Now what makes Jesus supernatural in his identity, and this is the prophecy, if you notice carefully in verse 2 it says this, Out of Bethlehem would come one who would be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Bethlehem, you're going to have a ruler. And his coming is from long, long, long ago. Ancient of days. That's a word that's used of God in other places, that God is a God. The, he is the, the ancient of days. It's a kind of a poetic way of saying he's eternal, that he by nature is, is everlasting. You know, since God has always existed eternally from everlasting, and He will always exist to everlasting, and by definition, that's not even the way you view eternity. Eternity is not primarily a function of time. It's not from some place to some place, but because our little finite minds uh, struggle with this concept, that's the only way we can think about it. But because of that, it means that our God is is infinite. He is self-existent, self-sustaining. He needs nothing in the world around him. That this one who is coming, that would be ruler, that at this time when this was written, that nobody knew the name of Jesus, they were looking for, anticipating a supernatural being that would come to this earth, that God would do something that would defy all of the past kings, that, that David was an amazing king who was raised up as a shepherd boy to literally shepherd Israel. That even though he was a great king, he was still a human king, limited in his capacity, limited in his understanding, limited in his lifetime and his experience. But we serve Jesus, who is everlasting, who by nature defies our logical understanding and experience, one that would be God himself who would come to this earth. You know what's significant about this? In the mid-1950s, there were copies of the Old Testament found that were, uh, at that time, a thousand years older than the oldest copy. I don't know if you know this or not, but in that pile of scrolls, and they found them over a series of years in these caves in Israel, and you can, you can Google it, Wikipedia, look at all of it. It's just amazing, all the scholars... Scholars who don't believe in God, who are by nature anti-supernaturalists, recognize this. But uh, we have copies of the book of Micah that are two to three hundred years before Jesus was ever born. In fact, there are so many prophecies about Jesus that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would take flight to Egypt. And in Isaiah 9, 6, it talks about being born of a virgin and all kinds of things. And these copies were all... The actual copy that we have was from before when Jesus was born. It's not just that it was written, the original was written before, the original was certainly written hundreds of years before that, but our copies are before Jesus was ever born. You see, many people look back skeptically, well, how do you know the Bible? And people kind of, you know, just changed it to make it look like certain things later on. No, this all happened before Jesus came, not after Jesus came. And Jesus is the only figure that fits. And what the Bible claims from him, and what he claims for himself, is to be a supernatural God himself and identity coming to this earth. Now, that is newsworthy. That is newsworthy to this day. That is something that nothing in this world can touch. I don't care what the latest Apple product that's rolling off the presses this year might be, whether it's a an iPhone or a tablet or whatever. I don't care what the, 
latest music group coming to the Times Union Center or what the latest whatever's coming that's awesome or what anything that's coming, none of it is of worthy of Jesus. Now, because Jesus is supernatural in his identity, he's also supernatural in his power. I want you to notice how this one, the Bible predicted of what Jesus would do. In verse 4, that he would stand, he wouldn't be a pushover, wouldn't be wishy-washy, and he would shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. He would shepherd it. You know, what's amazing to me is that God was always preparing someone that would come and solve the problems of our world. You see, when, Adam, when God made Adam and Eve and they sinned in the garden, God didn't say, oh no, I didn't see that coming. He didn't say, uh-oh, what am I going to do now? He didn't say, oops, I made a mistake. Those are words that God never says. God wasn't caught off guard. He knew exactly what was happening, and he had his plans in place from all along. From all along of eternity past, God was bringing forward his son Jesus to come and solve the sin problem of the world, the problems of the world that you and I have walked into and been born into, and that we carry that same genetic uh, spiritual dysfunction and disease called sin that, that causes all the problems between us and other people and all kinds of garbage around us. And that it means that you and I were not afterthoughts in the mind of God. It means that God didn't say, oh, well, I guess I got to do something for those poor souls. It's not like he saw us wandering around like a poor stray on the side of the road, you know, like, well, I guess I need to bring them in and take care of them. What it means is that you and I sit in a place of priority in God's eyes. It means that God from day one was planning and plotting and sending his son, Jesus, for you and for me. That ought to be exciting to us. That ought to encourage us. That ought to help us to know that, you know, God isn't ignoring us, that God is, sometimes it can be tough to hear God, or at least to feel like we're hearing from God, and sometimes like, God, are you really watching out for us? If you were, why is this happening and that happening? But you and I need to realize that God from eternity past, before you were ever born, he was already sending Jesus. And he was sending one who would have the ability to stand in this world that would not be taken away, that would not be uh, blown away, that would not be conquered, that would not be subdued, but who would stand and who would shepherd his flock in God's strength, the strength of the I am that I am, the strength of the self-existent one, the self-contained one, and that he would stand and he would shepherd, he would rule in the name of the I am in a way that no other prophet or anyone else ever would be able to. Think about what Jesus came to do in his supernatural strength. He is a shepherd. A shepherd's job in the Bible was to look after the sheep, to tend them, to care for them, to provide for them, to protect them. True, true confessions growing up, I didn't like the 23rd Psalm because the only time I ever heard about it was at funerals and I thought it was the most depressing Psalm that I have ever heard in my life. And uh, some of you are like, wow, Sean, you have issues. I really did, you know. I was probably that kid in Sunday school. You, you know, you probably have had one or two of me in your lifetime. I just thought, this is depressing because that's the only time I've heard it. But you know, the 23rd Psalm is really an amazing Psalm. The Lord God is my shepherd. He's my provider, my protector, my guider. I shall not, old King James want, we would say today, lack. I won't come up short. I won't need anything. Why? Because he's my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, not rocky, painful things, not in a land and a, a life that's thorny and full of thistles and full of rocks and rattlesnakes in the desert. And he leads us by the still waters, not the rushing, raging waters, but the quiet waters where we can be refreshed. He restores our soul. He protects us. That's the role of the shepherd. You see, Jesus comes and he has the supernatural strength to be able to guide you in your life, to be able to, to lead you. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways and everything that you do and all your ways, whether you're 
buying a home, selling a home, opening a bank account, taking a new job, wondering who to marry, where to live, how you should live your life, what to do in service to God. He says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He will shepherd your paths. He will guide you in your decision making because he's a supernatural God who has the strength and the ability to do just that. He's the one to be able to provide for you infinitely and supernaturally when you lose your job. He's the one able to provide for you even while you have a job he is still providing for you even now. All of us should truly say, thank you, God, for how you are shepherding me in my life. He is a powerful, amazing shepherd. And because he is one who guides and who cares and who feeds and protects, the Bible also gives us a picture in, in John chapter 10 that as the good shepherd, another aspect is that Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. You see, any shepherd worth his salt would risk his life to save the sheep. The shepherd didn't, you know, go and say, oh no, there's a bear, and run the other direction. In fact, it was the opposite. I'm amazed at David, Dave, King David, before he became king, he said, yeah, I fought a lion and a bear. Can you imagine going hand-to-hand -hand combat, eyeball to eyeball with a lion and a bear? I, not at that level. Now, I chased a bear once, I did. I stood up to a bear in the Adirondacks, but uh, he was after our neighbor's food. They were, we were camping in the high peaks and I don't know what they had. I think they brought in waiters and, you know, three course meal. I mean, it smelled good. They had like bacon and eggs. And I'm thinking, you carried all that stuff up here. You're insane. You know, I just, I'm like the freeze dried, you know, variety, whatever lightweight, but it smelled great. Problem was, you know, half hour after they made dinner, here comes a fisher running right through camp. And I'm like, what in the world? Fisher, by the way, are, in my mind, the toughest creature, pound for pound, of anything we got around here, tougher than a bear, pound for pound. Thankfully, they're only about that big. But, and then right after that, there's a bear coming into camp. And I, I went after it and scared it and chased it away. And then uh, he came around the camp that way. But I got to tell you, afterwards, I thought, well, that probably wasn't the smartest move, Sean, because... <laughs> You know, I didn't have anything on me. Like, I mean, nothing, not a trekking pole or anything. I just kind of bluffed it. But that's a million miles from what David did when he killed hand to hand the bear. What Jesus comes and does is even more than that. Jesus goes and fights the bear, and he willingly gave his life up for you and for me as the good shepherd. He saves us. He saved us out of our sin. You know, the greatest thing that God does for us is not taking care of us financially or, you know, making way in our life. Those are huge, and I don't diminish those, and I rely on those regularly, and I'm grateful for that. But the greatest thing that God does is he saves us from our sin. And I'm going to take, talk a little bit more about that when we talk about a supernatural salvation. But till then, I want you and I to celebrate that we serve a God who is supernatural power, and who superintends everything in our life and the world around us. That's the kind of Savior that we have. That's the kind of Lord and all the practical affairs of life. Our spiritual faith doesn't reside in something that we just think about and talk about on Sundays. It's a Monday to Saturday kind of thing. It's an all-encompassing every area of our life that God is our shepherd, providing and guiding and protecting leading us, nurturing us, admonishing us when we need it, correcting us when we're going down the wrong way. And he does it with a supernatural strength that comes from the hand of God himself, not in human strength. Now, those two realities, Jesus being God himself, who works and shepherds our soul supernaturally, means that what he does internal and for us and in us is also supernatural. Notice that what happens as a result of him shepherding us in the majesty of the name of the I am that I am of God on high. Look at verse 4, it says this, And they, talking about the Jews specifically, but secondarily talking about you and me when Jesus is our Lord, they, we, shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. 
You see, Jesus is a king unlike any other king. All other kings had their limited kingdoms, and they had their limited lifetimes. Jesus has been made shepherd and king, of which there is no end to his kingdom, both globally, both in time, time and space. And there's no limit in terms of power and in terms of influence in the world and in your world and in my world. And because of that, there's a key word here that you need to highlight and circle and make note of. We dwell secure. Secure. Period. Not in a, we don't dwell secure in a certain area of life or in a certain way. There's no qualification to this security. It, it's unending. It's unlimited. It's boundless. It's unqualified. Secure. That security that God was bringing and telling Israel, hey, you are being surrounded by armies now, and your pitiful little king that can't stand up against them is going to have his own slap on the cheek, his own eyes are going to be put out. He can't hold a candle to the one that I'm bringing. And when my son gets here, you will dwell secure. You will know what real security is like for the first time in your life to not be conquered, to dwell fully secure. That security works at least two directions, externally and internally. See, a good Jew would have been reading this and thinking, great, we're going to have secure borders. We're going to be able to stand up to our enemies. We're not going to be harassed and harangued and conquered anymore. Worry about what our kids are doing. And that's true. God secures us externally. We can trust him, folks, for all of that in our life today. But we turn to the New Testament, and specifically the book of Philippians chapter 4, and we discover that God secures us internally through Jesus. I want you to notice a passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 4. Look what the Bible says. It says in Philippians 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Be be excited and recognize the goodness of God always. And again, if you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to tell you again, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. In other words, he's close by. He's not far away. He's not inaccessible. He's close by. Verse 6, do not be anxious about what? Anything. He doesn't say some things. He says, don't. Literally stop being anxious about anything. Instead, in everything, by prayer and supplication, supplication is a specific kind of prayer, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and here's what happens. The peace of God, here's the inner security. God's peace, the peace that comes from God, that He alone produces, that's God-like, which surpasses all of our understanding. All, it's mind-blowing. We can't get our mind wrapped around it. That peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here's what Paul is telling us that Jesus does. When Jesus is your shepherd, he not only secures you externally, but if you are willing to truly trust and walk and follow him as your shepherd, that he will secure you internally. Anxieties begin to fall away. In fact, he says, don't be anxious about anything. There's no reason to. Why? Because we dwell secure. No reason to be fearful, afraid, worried, anxious. Because our shepherd has got it. He's a supernatural God with a supernatural power that we can trust in every way and in every area of our life. No matter what our eyes are telling us, no matter what the math in our head is telling us, no matter what our best friend is texting us that we should be thinking and all of that, that we have a supernatural God who says, hey, don't worry about this stuff. Instead, here's what you do. Pray. 
See, God doesn't dismiss it. God doesn't say, hey, be like an ostrich, just stick your head in the sand. I don't really think ostriches do that, but that's what the metaphor says. Don't, he doesn't say, just ignore it, be irrational, just be a, you know, just, oh, everything's going to be fine. He says, no, recognize the problem, recognize there's an issue, recognize the danger, recognize all the difficulty. But instead of worrying, doesn't it get you anywhere? Instead of being anxious, let your mind do something that's productive and pray. And turn your heart toward God. And while you're praying, thanking him. Thinking that he's already got the problem figured out. Thinking that he's bigger than the problem. Thanking him for all the times he's helped you in the past. And remembering and helping your own heart and mind to move past the worry and the anxiousness to a point of thanksgiving and trusting a God in heaven who loves you. And when you do that, you don't have to well this up. You don't have to, like, I got to figure this, I got to help make this happen. When you do that, there's an automatic supernatural peace that comes from God that secures your soul, we might say today. Your heart, your mind, all of your thinking and your feelings begin to follow out of that that secures you and you rest. Have you ever sat inside during a really bad snowstorm or a really bad storm and watched the wind blow and the snow howl and all of that? It always seems like I have to go out in one of those for one reason or another. But every once in a while, I can sit inside and drink my coffee and look and kind of either laugh at my kids or thank God for my kids that they're the ones out there snow blowing on this one and not me. You know, like, oh, it's so much better <laughs> to give than to receive on that one. Um, but have you ever looked at the storms, you know? When we have that kind of trust and walk with God, our life becomes more like that, more regularly. That the storms still swirl, but somehow in the middle of it, we're okay and we have a peace in the middle of that storm. Sean, are you saying that Christians should never have troubles? No, I'm not saying that at all. Sean, are you saying that you never worry? No, I'm definitely not saying that at all. Sean, are you saying you never wake up in the middle of the night, kind of like, you know, panic, whatever? No, no, definitely not saying that either. It's normal, it's natural, it's part of life. But I am saying this, is that what we do after those things hit, and as those things hit, that's what really matters. You see, we in the world today could just say, well, I just have that problem and I'm just going to live with it for the rest of my life. Or we could say, you know, the Bible says that there is a supernatural God who wants to deliver me from a lot of this stuff. In fact, it sure seems to be really clear that if I will turn to him, that even if I struggle in some of these areas, that I can gain victory and that I can have hope and a security, not just externally, but know that whatever is coming my way, that I'm okay. And I don't need to be afraid. And I don't need to be anxious. You see, Jesus gives us a security that is supernatural internally in our heart and soul. So much of the things and the patterns of life Let's, let's take an easy one. Let's, let's take one like anger. Really, we all get angry, right? I'd be the first to admit it for myself. But whenever I've been angry 90% of the time, it's because I didn't get my way. It's because I'm feeling threatened. It's because I'm feeling at risk, vulnerable, and I don't like it. And I'm trying to protect myself, my situation, and what's going on. In essence, in that moment, I'm not trusting Jesus as my shepherd. If I did, I wouldn't be needing to get so angry. And I wouldn't be reacting in that way. So trusting Jesus as my shepherd helps me to deal with anger. Helps me to deal with unforgiveness. Helps me to deal with past junk that people have done in my own life and heart and forgive and work through that. Some of the, the things that I get concerned about today, you know, the verses that we're talking about is that God's solution was to send Jesus to provide all of this in our life. And so often as Christians, we're beginning to settle for substitutes. 
solutions to all of these issues outside of Jesus. And I want to challenge you to be careful to even maybe have a little bit of a healthy cynicism, a healthy skepticism, if you can, and to really think through some of those, those issues of life. There is a tendency increasingly among us as people to feel the victims of our thoughts and all of our feelings and all of that. And truth of the matter is, is often it's when we're not thinking about the right stuff and thinking about it in the right way. Look what, look what Paul goes on to say in verse 8 of that same passage in Philippians 4. He says this, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Well, he just finished telling us that God's peace will guard our hearts and minds, and then he tells us kind of how to seal that. He says, look, put your minds, think about, meditate, dwell, focus, let go. We get into the worry and anxiety when we fixate on those other areas. Instead, put your mind on what's true. Half the time when that stuff creeps up into our life, we're fixated on things that are not true, but we're taking them as that they are. And he says, focus on that stuff. Put your mind on it, whatever's just, what's pure and lovely. It's, it's, it's more than power of positive thinking. It's more than positivity. It's, it comes from a children who have a shepherd who loves them and provides and cares for them, and they've learned to walk in truth in the world around them to see the world rightly. Not to see the world as a, a skewed kind of thing, but to see it, see it correctly. As God's children, we should be careful not to set aside those spiritual realities in so many areas of our life. Increasingly, it's difficult for churches to trust, um, uh, to trust biblical truth, I think, when it comes to the areas of counseling. And Sean, are you saying that there's no counseling worth anything outside the Bible? No, I'm not even saying that. Sean, are you after? No, I'm not. I do want us to be careful, though, that we don't move so quickly beyond the Bible that we jettison God's answers that are right in front of us and we settle for substitutes around us. And God tells us that he becomes our shepherd. Now, can God use some of those to sh as he shepherds us? Absolutely, absolutely. But make sure we're giving not only credit to God, but let's make sure that we're seeking God in the middle of all of that. That's the supernatural change that God brings, supernatural results with a God who works inside of us, that works through all the anger and works through all of the junk and all of the things in our past and our own desires. And he does it through a supernatural salvation. I'm going to share this just kind of quickly. We don't really have time to, to delve long ways into it, but look at Micah chapter 7 with me. How does God bring these changes in our life? Well, he does it through Jesus, and he does it when he overcomes our sin. Chapter 7, the Bible says in verse 2 that the godly has perished from the earth, and there's no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. So their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. Micah's describing a world in which God is non-existent in people's lives. And what he's saying is, is that, look, there's nobody who's really righteous. He's looking at the world, a world that's gone completely away from God. And when briberies reign and rule the day, and in fact, people are actively trying to be good at being bad. They try to work hard at being evil. Have you ever, you know, sat back? Some of the people do like, uh, like hackers. You read some of the stories about people that are brilliant and how they hack this and that. I'm thinking, why wouldn't they just take those smarts and do something to make money at it legally? I'm like, oh my goodness. I don't know if there's an adrenaline rush about doing something illegally or what, but like you are really smart. You ought to put it to good use to do something. But that's what he's talking about is that people that are 
When God is out of the picture, the overall population becomes headlong trying to be good at being bad. Now get further the state of affairs. He tells in verse 5, when that happens, put no trust in a neighbor, no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. Oh my goodness, he's talking about a wife, girlfriend. He says, look, when this world gets so bad and messed up and God's not in the picture, you can't trust your neighbor. You can't trust your own wife. The one closest to you that you would be most vulnerable with, you better guard your mouth. You can't trust them. Why? Because of the actions that they will do towards you. He says, for the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against the mother. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord I will wait for the God of my salvation, and my God will hear me. Micah's saying, guys, here's the thing. As a people, you are running headlong away from God. And the more you do that, the more your society and culture is going to break down. Even family at the very basic level will fall apart. Moms who should be loved and treasured will be vulnerable to their own kids. Husbands and wives will no longer be able to trust one another. The very fabric, if you will, of the society and culture breaks down without God in that picture. And the real shame of it is, is that's you and me too. That's not just those guys, that's us. That's the deception and deceit that we have, you know, allow into our own lives that do damage to the ones that we care and are close to. But Micah says, again, here's the hope in the middle of the bad news. But if we will turn our eyes to God and put our trust in Him, He's the hope of sal our salvation, not just out of this mess, but out of the mess in our own heart. That's what he finishes with in verse 18. Dealing with the mess of our own heart, he says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? for the remnant of his inheritance. Talking about God, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in the steadfast love. He's the one that pardons our sin. He's the one that looks over all of the junk in our heart when he saves us. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. God provides a supernatural salvation through His Son, Jesus, who is the good shepherd, gave His life, laid His life down for the sheep. And He did that so that He could bury your sins and mine in the depths of the ocean. In other words, never to be brought up again. This is not a little bottle with a cork in it that floats along that 50 years later somebody's going to find in Siberia or who knows where, Norway or some coastal country. He takes our sin and he puts the heaviest weight on it and he goes to the deepest part of the ocean, miles below the water, and it's gone. And all that junk in our life and all that garbage, he removes. And instead, we get security, both his blessing on our life and we get security spiritually, internally, we get security, a relationship with him forever. In fact, that security, if you know in John 10 again, Jesus says, look, when, when you trust me as the shepherd, you're in my hand and no one can take you out. In fact, you're in my hand and I'm in my father's hand and nobody's going to take you out. Our security of our salvation comes from the fact that he's our shepherd and makes us secure everything in our life because he changes us and saves us. So this morning, I don't know where you are spiritually, relationally, where your mind is. Hopefully it's not quite on lunch uh, or what you're doing this afternoon. But I want to challenge you to take something from what you've heard out of God's Word and apply it to your life. Maybe you are someone that has struggled with with anxiety in your life. I love hearing our salvation stories of so many people that say, I used to have such depression and anxiety, but when Jesus came, I handle it better. 
You know, if you listen carefully, I don't hear a complete deliverance out of it. You know, that would be basically to not be human. That would be a robot, right? But I love the fact that Jesus is changing and giving people a hope and a reason to trust. And maybe that's an area of your life that you've wrestled with and maybe you've allowed some of that to stay there more than it needs to. Look to Jesus as your shepherd. He defends you with a supernatural defense, with a vengeance he loves and cares for you. Trust him. You're never vulnerable when you're in his hands. Never, never. You're secure. He makes that promise over and over and over to us. Maybe you're someone who's never really trusted Jesus to save you from your sins. I want to urge you today to do that, to simply say, Lord Jesus, I, I know that I've sinned. Would you forgive me and save me? I want you to be my shepherd. Would you be in charge? I'm done being in charge of my life. That's the best prayer that anyone could ever pray. And it's a prayer that will move you from being outside of Jesus' care to right in the middle of care, move you from being insecure to secure, being unforgiven of your sins to being completely forgiven, to go from your sins being right in front of you to your sins being buried in the deepest part of the ocean. Maybe there's something else that God's talked to you about this morning that you need to give Him thanks for. I don't know. But our worship team's going to come up and uh, we're going to sing a song, and this is your time to simply respond to God. If you want to think, think. If you want to sing, sing. If you need to pray, pray. But whatever God's putting in your heart, trust Him. Trust Him. Be careful with other substitutes. He alone is worthy of being your, your shepherd. Let me pray. Father, I thank You that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. Thank You for His salvation. Thank You for His care. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.